It's Chris, the Dating Doc, and this entire episode is going to be an intro to Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, and we're also going to deep dive into ENFJ, which happens to be my type indicator. Stay tuned. So first off, it is my birthday today, March 27, March 27, 2021. I was born in 81, so do the math in a whole new decade. I am 4-0. And normally, I, I, I do these uh, birthdays where I go into some philosophical quote on social media about how content I am. But you know, it's not toxic for us to have these pockets of being selfish. So if you're listening to this and you want to make your way to Instagram, find me at the dating doc, send me a birthday greeting, send me a hi, send me a big four Oh, whatever you want, but I'm going to be a little selfish. Sometimes you have to be selfish to be able to serve others, right? As long as we're not permanently selfish. So yeah, send me a shout out, send, send the birthday boy shout out. Now, Normally, I do these podcasts all in pretty much one day, one take. I am, however, going to split it because I'm going to practice what I preach by practicing my own boundaries and relax time so I can reset the brain. And as I alluded to, I can't serve others if I'm not being a little bit selfish. So this little part, this little piece that I'm doing for this podcast episode is on my actual birthday. The rest of the content, maybe I'll do it tonight. Maybe I'll do it tomorrow, but just wanted to drop off a little bit of a birthday shout out to the man in the mirror. And like I said, if you want to spend a minute of your time, send me a greeting. I would appreciate that. So I'm starting an entire new series on Myers-Briggs. Myers-Briggs personality type is something that I want to do for three reasons. First off, you need some conversation ammo. You need some conversation fuel, whatever you want to call it. But instead of just asking the same old, how long have you lived in this city? What do you do for a living? What do you enjoy about what you do for a living? Let's talk about the inner person. I think it's important, right? To to be able to ask a potential suitor or during a date, hey, what's your Myers-Briggs? What ends up happening is they either know their personality set, but they may not be aware of how compatible they are to yours. It's one of those things where you might take a quick 15 minute quiz and you find out what Myers-Briggs type indicator you are. And that's it. So I wanted to do this series to bring a little bit of awareness for those that have never been exposed to Myers-Briggs or Myers-Briggs type indicators and also for those that are aware of it, how they can use it uh, to, to their best advantage. So this first series is going to briefly explain Myers-Briggs, gonna go through just a quick overview, and then I'm going to take some time to explain ENFJ. ENFJ is my Myers-Briggs type indicator, so being a little bit selfish there, but I'm going to start off with that one. It's one that I could easily remember because it's the one that I am. And hopefully from there, you're able to look at what kind of people you've dated in the past that you avoided after a couple of bad experiences and those that you are more attracted to based on good experiences. Or inversely, you may be attracted to a certain type that have toxic traits but it just happens to be what you're attracted to. So hopefully with this Myers-Briggs series, we're able to not only get you to have some conversation going during your dates, also bring awareness to systematically, uh, in, in a very systemic way, excuse me, being able to define some trends in your dating life. Because a lot of us may think things happen at random or we don't really measure them or look back on any patterns, hopefully through Myers-Briggs type indicator and learning more about it, then that could help you out. And then lastly is we want those that are familiar with Myers-Briggs to be even more familiar 
and really add that to their overall understanding. So to recap, the reason that I'm doing this again is conversation fodder. We need it. Second also is how to be able to define your dating world in a systemic way. And third, to provide an even more advanced overview for those that have been exposed to Myers-Briggs. So without further ado, let's get into the purpose of Myers-Briggs and also the four basic preferences that Carl Jung and Catherine Briggs came up with to explain MBTI. So I'm starting an entire new series on Myers-Briggs. Myers-Briggs personality type is something that I want to do for three reasons. First off, you need some conversation ammo. You need some conversation fuel, whatever you want to call it. But instead of just asking the same old, how long have you lived in this city? What do you do for a living? What do you enjoy about what you do for a living? Let's talk about the inner person. I think it's important, right, to, to be able to ask a potential suitor or during a date, hey, what's your Myers-Briggs? What ends up happening is they either know their personality set, but they may not be aware of how compatible they are to yours. It's one of those things where you might take a quick 15 minute quiz and then you find out what Myers-Briggs type indicator you are. And that's it. So I wanted to do this series to bring a little bit of awareness for those that have never been exposed to Myers-Briggs or Myers-Briggs type indicators. And also for those that are aware of it, how they can use it uh, to, to their best advantage. So this first series is going to briefly explain Myers-Briggs, it's gonna go through just a quick overview. And then I'm going to take some time to explain ENFJ. ENFJ is my Myers-Briggs type indicator. So being a little bit selfish there, but I'm going to start off with that one. It's one that I can easily remember because it's the one that I am. And hopefully from there, you're able to look at what kind of people you've dated in the past that you avoided after a couple of bad experiences and those that you are more attracted to based on good experiences. Or inversely, you may be attracted to a certain type that have toxic traits, but it just happens to be what you're attracted to. So hopefully with this Myers-Briggs series, we're able to not only get you to have some conversation going during your dates, also bring awareness to systematically, uh, in, in a very systemic way, excuse me, being able to define some trends in your dating life. Because a lot of us may think things happen at random or we don't really measure them or look back on any patterns. Hopefully through Myers-Briggs type indicator and learning more about it, then that could help you out. And then lastly is we want those that are familiar with Myers-Briggs to be even more familiar and really add that to their overall understanding. So to recap, the reason that I'm doing this again is conversation fodder. We need it. Second also is how to be able to define your dating world in a systemic way. And third, to provide an even more advanced overview for those that have been exposed to Myers-Briggs. So without further ado, let's get into the purpose of Myers-Briggs and also the four basic preferences that Carl Jung and Catherine Briggs came up with to explain MBTI. So according to myersbriggs.org, which is the official website for Myers-Briggs and the Myers-Briggs Foundation, the purpose of the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, MBTI, is to make the theory of psychological types described by Carl Jung understandable and useful in people's lives. Again, this goes back to what I was alluding to about trying to make order out of the perceived chaos. The essence of the theory is that much seemingly random variation in the behavior is quite actually orderly and consistent being due to basic differences in the ways individuals prefer to use their perception and judgment. 
let's deep down into uh, perception and judgment here. Perception involves all the ways of becoming aware of things, people, happenings, or ideas. Judgment involves all the ways of coming to conclusions about what has been perceived. If people differ systematically in what they perceive and how they reach conclusions, then it is only reasonable for them to differ correspondingly in their interests, reactions, values, motivations, and skills. So that might have been a mouthful, but bottom line, it goes back to look at the top of the umbrella being perception. Then you go into judgment and conclusions under that perception. And people get to that finish line in different ways. And this is all based on their interests, reactions, values, motivations, and skills. So what I like about MBTI, and I want this to be something that I want you to be aware of, is it does not discriminate based on income level. It does not discriminate on education. There are some people that may be aware of their MBTI type, and they can find someone that addresses those preferences in a very healthy way. And as we go through this series, you'll see that these these four dichotomies that are specified or implicit in Jung's theory, they break down into these 16 distinct personality types. So I'm going to segue into that now. The four dichotomies that we're talking about here that Jung's theory talks about is information, decisions, structure, in favorite world. So I'm going to start off with favorite world. Do you prefer to focus on the outer world or your own inner world? This is what you can call extroversion or introversion, right? Extrovert, introverts. Now, again, this has nothing to do with shy folks or introverted and social folks or extroverted. It all boils down to Where do you focus? On the outer world or your inner world? This is different from locus of control. For those that are familiar with locus of control, locus of control is where do you place your blame and motivations into the internal or external, which is different from the focus. So I I want you to look at the context of this for those that want to make that, that difference. Do you focus on the outer world? Do you gain energy from being out and about the outer world? Or do you look within? This is not mutually exclusive, as we know. That's why we have these quizzes and things of that sort. So you can find out where do you, where's that dividing line? Where do you have a little bit more majority of extroversion versus introversion? The second of these uh, four dichotomies is information. Do you prefer to focus on the basic information you take in, which is sensing, or do you prefer to interpret and add meaning? This is called intuition. Very hard to explain for those that see them almost synonymous. All right, for one of them is you're taking it in. You're you're kind of like, it's almost you're, you're, you're going with the flow with the way the information is being pulled and given. Where intuition, you do give some value to that gut feeling, right? You give it meaning. So it's, it's different because the way that I see sensing versus intuition is that sensing is being very pragmatic and just taking it how it is. You hear something, you hear someone say something, you um, possibly take in a scenario, you, you just you just absorb it. It's the basic information. Where intuition, intuition is rational thinking on turbo, in my opinion. So intuition is, let's say you're dating someone and you say, I don't think that person is good for me. That's that's the intuition part. 
where sensing is almost like, I feel like this doesn't work. You see how one is so almost basic, not, not to take value away from it, whereas the other one borrows a little more of thinking. Okay, so that's information, right? Which Just to recap, we went, we went into favorite world, extroversion, introversion, and information, sensing or intuition. Decisions. When you're making decisions, do you prefer to first look at logic and consistency or do you look at the people in special circumstances? And again, that's thinking versus feeling, which is very related to information, except now the difference is you have made a decision. You, you have made a decision based on logic and trends, consistency, or you create a little bit more space and flexibility where now there's not much of rational thinking or a mental formula going in your head. And you may be considering such things as people's perspectives or the environment that they grew up in or that you grew up in. And all of that goes into a certain oomph, a certain feeling, which can relate to in intuition, except this is how you come at that final conclusion. That final decision is you're either thinking or you're feeling it. For example, if I'm walking down a an alley that doesn't have any lighting, right? It, it seems dangerous. The thinking part is going to say there are no lights. And I remember in the newspapers at least twice this area being stricken with all kinds of robberies and assaults as based on logic, rational thinking, gathering evidence. Feeling is if I'm never aware of the newspapers and I'm not aware that this area is is dangerous, but I just feel like something's going on. This is all based on people in special circumstances where I can almost smell it in the air that something's not right about this. And I make the decision based on what I feel versus thinking it makes no logical sense for me to go down that alley because there's no lighting. And based on some of the, the trends, this is not a safe area anyway. So that's decisions. Structure. Structure is the fourth of four of the dichotomies. And it's how do you deal with the outside world? Do you prefer to get things decided or, you to or do you prefer to stay open to new information and options? This is judging or perceiving. Now, judging, especially nowadays in this modern society that's addicted to division and arguing, et cetera, et cetera, judging may seem like a very negative connotation. We all, at, at one level or the other, we judge. We do judge. If someone spills milk or spills water and they do it more than twice, we assume that person's clumsy. We will make that quick decision, right? We, we would know that, hey, things have been decided. Now, some of us have the benefit of the doubt and we may say, well, we're going to stay open to new information. We're, we're, we're going to... We're going to see what happens. Maybe, maybe I'll be the one to spill the water. Maybe I have to look at the fact that it was Wendy, the, the two times that this person spilled water, or I have to figure out that the person has cerebral policy or some sort of condition on why they can hold that versus judging can be quick, can be, Hey, look, things have been decided. So. When you use these four dichotomies, information, decisions, structure, and favorite world, then that's how you come up with the 16 distinct personality types. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into a little bit, tie up the history real quick in this next section, and then jump into ENFJ. Stay tuned. So as I wrap up the history of Myers-Briggs, it's super important, especially as we're looking at International Women's Month, is the fact that, yes, Carl Jung, Carl Jung, 
if I'm pronouncing it correctly, whichever version you have there, Carl G. Jung. He was the one that came up with psychological type in the 1920s, but it's not called the June type indicator. It's called Myers-Briggs indicator. So it's important that we know that the MBTI tool itself, that was developed in 1940s by Isabel Briggs Myers, and the original research was done in the 1940s and 50s. The research is ongoing. It's providing users with updated and new information about psychological type and its applications. As we know, especially in the singles world, millions of people worldwide have taken the indicator each year since its first publication in 1962. So it's important that we understand the sequential evolution of types, of archetypes, which can be an entire other podcast series, and specifically Isabel Briggs Myers, who coined the Myers-Briggs type indicator and came up with the foundation itself. So without further ado, let's go into ENFJ. ENFJ is one of the 16 personality types. As uh, I discussed in the last section, there are 16 different types and they use a four letter code to uh, differentiate between the uh, personality types. So I'm going to go into something fun here. This is going to go into the strengths of a uh, a protagonist. That's what an EF, ENFJ-A or ENFJ-T is uh, called. Now, I've seen Defender. I've used Protagonist before. I'm going to stick with Protagonist. This is based on 16personalities.com, which is another reliable source for Myers-Briggs type indicator type. So some of the strengths of an EF, ENFJ is we are tolerant. Okay, We're true team players and we recognize other people's opinions even if they contradict their own it's something that's obviously super helpful as a dating coach we are reliable we don't want to let a person down now this is going to go down into one of the weaknesses stay tuned stay sharp you know stay attentive and you'll see what i'm talking about here charismatic all right i gotta stay i I gotta do a humble brag here because i i came from a very shy I type. I'm pretty sure as a kid growing up, I might have been an INFJ. I, I really mean it. I'm, I'm sure I was very introverted. And yes, I do mean that simple general generalization of being shy and, and looking within because I didn't understand my extroverted world because I didn't even know language. Fast forward. Now I can't shut up, right? I'm bilingual somewhat trilingual, you know, uh, shout out to my Brasileiros. I learned a little bit of Portuguese there, but I'm charismatic. I, I would say I'm charismatic. And I, I mean that in a way where I, I hold humble space that that is a, a quality that um, I use to serve others. So I can capture an audience, especially a lot more than when I was a kid. And I do try to communicate with reason, emotion, passion, and restraint, whatever the situation calls for, whether it's military, business, working with a client, as a father, as a brother, as a friend, et cetera, et cetera. Altruistic. I love to love. I love being a giver. Definitely. Natural leaders. You know the deal, right? In the military world and in the dating world, I have to keep myself self-accountable. I have to keep my brand clean and strong because guess what? I do believe that part of being in servitude is being a leader. So, in the military, you know, I, I have been placed in a leadership role at either at the request of, of others or through authoritative means, through promotions and things of that sort. And um, I do pride myself a little bit in a healthy way on having a strong personality and positive vision. So that's some of the, the strengths of an ENFJ. Now, these weaknesses I'm aware of but we can always use some work. So as I'm aware of these weaknesses, I try to fix them, I I do, but we all fall short in one way or the other. So overly idealistic. It's one of those things where I can sometimes myself be caught off guard. I might find circumstances or nature is very simple. And one of those things where I can sometimes earn a reputation of being very naive. This is something that, again, I'm very aware of, a little too pragmatic. And um, 
Yes, at, at times I do feel more pity for my opposition more than anger. And m- maybe that could be part of that, that strength, right, of being altruistic. Um, maybe there's times when I should feel anger. It's just something I'm working on. Too selfless. Yes, I have sometimes blamed myself for spreading myself too thin. I remember there's been days when I have drove to the other side of town and dropped something off just so I can make it on time for a networking event, just to make it on time to do a client call at 10 p.m. And I haven't taken any space for myself, haven't meditated, haven't taken any naps, haven't plugged into who I am uh, so I can recenter. So yes, selfless is dangerous, too sensitive. Uh, There has been times when I take criticism and uh, I might get a little sensitive. It's something that I'm aware of because in the premise of not only being an ENFJ, but also being aware to be, to practice healthy masculinity instead of toxic masculinity, where I get so hypersensitive because I think it's a dig at who I am as a man. I need to be able to, to compartmentalize that and I know that, okay, if I was zero gender, I'm still a little bit sensitive because I'm taking, I'm taking to heart a critique, but then I also know because of that, that somewhat alpha with a little bit of sigma testosterone filled military experienced guy who's a business owner, I can get sensitive because now I'm looking at it through the lens of being a man. Same thing with a woman, right? You can get too sensitive based on the environment and the context of what that critique is all about. So um, I often do feel like I wanna fix things that I can't fix, or I worry that I'm not doing enough. So yes, there, there's some sensitivity issues there. And that's not weakness, that's being aware of it. Fluctuating self-esteem. This is again, something that's listed on 16personalities.com. I would agree with that. There is a fluctuating self-esteem where if I meet a goal, I feel like a million bucks. If I don't meet a couple of my deadlines or tasks, then yeah, my, my self-confidence may plummet a little bit, may take a couple steps back. And what I'm actually doing to counter that is practicing a lot of stoicism. And what I mean is literally the philosophy of stoicism, things like memento mori, the fact that you can die tomorrow, so why worry about that? Um, meditation has really helped because I'm able to, in a way, predict patterns in the future of how I may act or how I'm going to respond to something. So that's really helped out. So I don't plummet my self-confidence or feel as if I'm not self-validating because I fell short of what my task or goal was that day. Now, the last one, I... I don't really possess this one. I'm pretty executive when it comes to my decisions, but one weakness that's been listed is the struggle to make tough decisions. The fact that if we're caught between a rock and a hard place, we can go into analysis paralysis. Again, at least this is for ENFJs. You're not always going to get 100% accuracy with, with these tests, right? You can't, it's, it's almost like the old TV guide horoscopes, right? Shout out to anyone who used to check out those horoscopes on TV guide, by the way. <laughs> Let's see if, if you guys did. Um, you know, it, it's not like if you fall into these personality types, you either have to adhere to them or that you're, you're somehow not, you know, fulfilling your personality type. No, there, there's going to be a couple of different variances with it. And, that, and that's fine. I don't feel like I make or, or I lack decision making in the military I can make a pretty quick decision. I think the hardest thing for me would be maybe a (laughs) a lot of people can can identify with this, uh, a Netflix show or movie that you wanna watch of all those choices, right? The paradox of choices or what to eat. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes the menu is so big and all the food looks good. I don't know, I don't know what to pick, right? Other than that, when it comes to quote unquote hard decisions that do have an impact, I'm pretty quick on them. And that does go back to what I would say is that intuitive piece, which is uh, falls into the ENFJ part. So that was the strength and weaknesses that might have been long. I'm now going to go into some of the romantic relationships of an ENFJ. Stay tuned.
When it comes to ENFJ and romantic relationships slash dating, one thing I'm going to pat myself on the back is not only the fact that I'm a dating coach and this helps, but being an ENFJ, we're ready to show our commitment by taking the time and effort to establish ourselves as dependable, trustworthy partners. What's interesting about this is I often tell clients or my followers, content creation, those that are following my stuff, is it doesn't matter if you're looking for long or short term. If you can practice respect, honesty, and communication, then you're dependable. It doesn't matter if it's a Netflix and chill or something a lot more serious. And I do agree that ENFJs, my, my type, we do feel like more at home when we are in a committed relationship, a very loving, committed relationship. We do take it serious. And even though we do have bouts of our casual approach that might be expecting some types of the extroverted, for us, we, we do find greater joy and being able to interweave our lives with someone. That's something that um, I did see through my readings on uh, 16personalities.com. My best relationships have been with those that have the intuitive trait because we're able to both keep up with the rapidly shifting moods that are common early in relationships. You normally have that where at the beginning, you're getting to know the person and you may be a little bit warm, hot, cold, all at the same time, because in a way you're almost testing yourself and testing your, your prospective partner to see in, can they handle me? Whether you consciously do that or subconsciously do that, there is a lot of change happening in the first couple of months, especially if you like the person a lot. As someone who has the intuitive trait, which is a second uh, breakdown, second archetype, right? E being extroversion, N being that intuitive, is the fact that we can keep up. We can manage conflicts a lot better. And it's one of those things where we can also risk being overbearing or needy if we don't keep it in mind. And that's a good thing about the intuitive trait is that we're able to shift the boat however we want it, right? If we're, if we're getting too close to one edge or the other, we don't want that boat to break apart, right? We want to go down that, that flow, that nice smooth river, right? So we need to know how to manage that. And that goes without saying, regardless of your personality type. Another thing for uh, the protagonists, aka ENFJs, is we don't need much to be happy. We like to know that our partner is happy and we just want them to express it through visible affection. And for us, whether it's business, whether it's romantic relationships or friendships, we like to see other people's goals come to fruition. We like to see that. And we are that type of team player where if we can help push you to the finish line of whatever your goal or your dream is, then hey, that's what we do. The problem is if we do it to a point where we start neglecting ourselves, right? If we get to a point where we're neglecting ourselves because we're trying to make sure that their needs are met, but not our own, then that could be dangerous. Um, this could be also good and bad is that protagonists, we try to avoid conflict. Even if we sacrifice our own principles to keep the peace, this can lead to long-term problems. Me, I like to fully resolve those issues. That kind of goes back to that decisive mindset, which is not a weakness that I possess, which is one listed for ENFJs. And as we know that if we're too eager, we can undermine the relationship and it, it can lead to resentment. If you're one of these protagonists that's diving down, really trying to make the relationship work and manage it and whatnot, it just kills the vibes at times. It can lead to the failure of the relationship. And what ends up happening afterward, which is important, is that protagonists can experience a strong sense of guilt and betrayal because they've seen all their efforts slip away. That's why efforts does not entitle you to a relationship. You, you cannot assume that just because you've done all the work, you know, what if you're being over, overbearing or, you know, you're being needy? 
What if someone loses respect for you because they see that you are no longer taking care of yourself? You're trying to do everything for the relationship. They can lose respect for you. And in the end, you're so blinded. You think, I did all this and now poof, it's gone. No, you did all this, but you didn't take care of the person in the mirror. Or you came out looking very insecure with all guns blazing, trying to help the relationship. But in the end, not holding true to your self-respect. But if the partner that you have appreciates those qualities, right? And makes an effort themselves, then you got something good. You got a happy, passionate relationship. Protagonists, aka ENFJs, were known to be dependable lovers. And well, we're kind of more interested in routine and stability and in our sex lives, but I disagree. I'm not gonna go into my personal life, but I know I like to change it up when it comes to my sex life. But I do agree whether they do like routine and stability, which is kind of more in line, you know, generaliza- generalization of uh, ENFJ or my version of ENFJ, which is a little bit, you know, a little, little couple degrees away is we want to satisfy our partners. True happiness is mutual happiness. And that's what it's all about for an ENFJ. Hope you enjoyed this. Subscribe. Tell your friends about the Dating Doc Podcast. We can't do this without you. And it's not a community of singles until the word is spread. Thank you very much. Stay tuned for the next episode. This is Dating Doc. Check it out.